Not waving back. It's so good. That's why we have insurance. It was yeah, not. It shouldn't make sound. Uh, it might have. Uh. Glory. Hello and welcome back to the vlog. Today we are still north of Fort McMurray with Suncor. However, there's one small difference between today and the Millennium Mine we visited yesterday. And that is because this is the extension part of the mine, the newer part of the mine. That's a shovel, 4100, we just saw those yesterday, but the difference is the trucks. That is because the trucks are all fully autonomous. They've been running autonomous here since 2016. For years now, they have over 30 autonomous trucks floating around here. We just drove by a bunch on our way up here. The reason why there's no trucks behind us now is this dozer right here is knocking down this sand that was just brought in to provide this shovel with a stable area to work in. Once that dozer's out of there, the trucks are gonna start coming in here. There's no driver, they're being run by computers. Now, that's not to say there's a lot of people that are required to make this operation run. Like that dozer operator, that shovel operator, that blade operator, the fuel trucks, but the trucks themselves, their Komatsu 930s and 980s are entirely autonomous, running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, only stopping for fuel and maintenance. Wild. So to give everybody a little bit of history. Autonomous mining trucks are uh, far further along in a lot of ways than autonomous cars or on-road trucks because they've been around for a long time. So Komatsu, the funny thing was they said, Komatsu doesn't, you don't really go to Komatsu and say, we want to be an autonomous mine. Komatsu comes to you. So first place Komatsu started to automate was down in Chile. And that's because there's little rain, it's hard rock. The ground conditions are pretty consistent. Then they took it to Australia, Western Australia, the Iron Ore Range, where again, the conditions are, for the most part, consistent. If you have consistent conditions, the trucks do really well. Then the next natural part to automate, the next natural location to choose was Fort McMurray. The only challenge with Fort McMurray is the ground conditions. Right now, you can have slick conditions with the ice. In the summer, you can have soft and wet conditions, but they haven't had any problems with these trucks. They've got it so dialed in that that truck can, if it's slipping, for example, to test it, it took a water truck and intentionally made a bunch of ice. And that truck, once it starts slipping, it can identify faster than a human can identify that it is slipping and it'll stop, slow down, do what it needs to do to adjust. Uh, a major difference out here compared to the mine we were at yesterday with manned vehicles is the haul roads. The haul roads are much wider and they are much more smooth. To run the autonomous trucks efficiently, you need to have more haul road maintenance. So there's a lot of blades out here. They're dropping a lot of gravel on all of these roads. They're beautiful. They're very smooth. Now behind me is the shovel. The shovel is run by an operator. That shovel controls where the trucks go. So the shovel will go over to one pocket and will basically on the computer say, this is where I want the truck to be. And then he'll go over, swing onto the other side. He'll swing on the other side and say, this is where I want this truck to be. So as they're working on their face, the truck, the autonomous truck will come in, back up exactly where that shovel wants to be. They'll load. Once that truck is loaded, the truck will then go to the crusher fully autonomously. 
And here we have a truck coming in right now. Okay, we're at the second location where we're checking out another P&H 4100 and behind me is of course a, a Komatsu PC 8000, a big, big shovel. We couldn't get out of the bus. We just pulled up. These are again autonomous trucks, so that there is no driver in that truck behind me getting loaded right now. We couldn't get out of the bus because this guy right here in this pickup truck had to essentially draw a line around where we're standing right now, which tells the autonomous trucks, hey, that's now the boundary. That autonomous truck cannot drive here. And if for whatever reason it did not register that boundary, which isn't really possible, but if it didn't, then you have an obstacle detection system that says, hey, there's an obstacle here, you need to stop. And if that wasn't going, we have the red button to shut everything down, override all the systems. But because he drew this little line around us, those trucks can't get where I'm standing right now. Hey Chase, you have my audio? Can we put the stats to that PC8000 on the screen right here? Okay. Yeah. Cool, thanks man. All right, we started the day up at the loading areas. We saw the P&H shovels, that PC-8000 loading the Komatsu 930s and 980s. Now, this is a previously mined area that's being filled back up for the sake of reclamation. So within, I don't know, maybe a decade or so, this whole area will be filled, it'll be replanted. It'll essentially be back to a boreal forest, but for now, it's this dump location. So the trucks, the dispatch at that central facility will tell the trucks what shovels they're going to and then what dumps they're going to. There's multiple dumps here. This is one dump. The trucks will come in here and then that dozer is who controls this dump area. So that dozer sets the boundary, says here's where the trucks are going to be dumping and then the trucks will automatically come in here. It backs right up. Perfect. Every single time and then that dozer can clean up the dump for the next trucks to come in here. So that is, I guess, my best explanation as far as this is concerned. One thing I did learn about, there goes another truck. One thing I did find interesting is these trucks are extraordinarily accurate. So when they back in to either side of a shovel, they can get it within a quarter of an inch. And it's the same thing with the dump location. If they, the dozer says, I want you to dump here, dumps exactly there every single time. There's no real discrepancy. So in here we have more trucks. But here is a 797. They run both Komatsu and Cat here, primarily Komatsu, but they also have to maintain these big boys. That's amazing. It's like a it's like a whole hallway all the way back where the engine's supposed to go. Look at that. Oh wow. Yeah. Proper. We've seen a lot of trucks out and about, but this is where all of those trucks come to get maintained or fixed, nursed back to health, so that they they can keep hauling as much material around the clock as possible. Right behind me is the engine for a 980 Komatsu truck. They also have the smaller 930 that's right behind Chase. 
this engine is about to go into this truck. So this shop will do anything from preventative maintenance, basic oil changes, changing out filters, hoses, that kind of thing, to major work like, hey, we need to replace the engine in this truck. So this is what it takes, all of this infrastructure, is to maintain these trucks from the non-stop abuse they get out in the field from the slippery wet conditions to the brutal cold to the really hot part of the summer. These trucks put up with a lot and all of these mechanics around here are the ones in charge of making them work as much as possible. Big shot. Big shot. Big shot. <laughs> this is what our guy Cat needed the other day. Because he was using his hands, I'm like, nah, you need one of these. You need one of these. Light side or dark side, Aaron? Uh, I'm, I'm more of a Luke Skywalker kind of guy. Oh, that was a pleasant surprise. That was awesome. Highlight of my day. We can talk about the robot truck. This is another Komatsu 980, but this is one of the autonomous trucks. You can tell it's not all that different looking from the manned 980s. The biggest difference is, is the radar, LIDAR system up front for object detection to figure out where that truck needs to go. And then it has the antennas up there, both sides for positioning to make sure the truck can drive accurately as it goes along. But otherwise, this is a pretty standard machine. You can even get up in that cab and drive it manned if you'd like to. It doesn't always have to be remote, but that is what one of those autonomous truck lo trucks looks like up close. How long does a PM typically take? That's a great question. Let's, let's ask. Steve. Let's ask Steve. Steve. Let's go ask Steve. Hey, Gary. When you ask Gary? Gary. 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 So logistically, the fastest we could do it with electricians, SMS, uh, Cummins all in, in one day if we could plan it all so they're all ready to go. One shift. One we shift. Can, we can move it over. How much oil is in one of these? Uh, wheel motors. 90 liters, 55 liters. These are over 200, 290 to, it varies. How often do you have to change out the oil? Uh, we check the oil every, every time they basically fuel it up. So this would be uh, every other day or every day. So these trucks are in the shop quite a few times in a one year period. Cause uh, you're put, I mean, how many hours a year and you're putting on like five, 6,000? Yeah, they're about a, every six months. Yes. About a thousand hours. Yes. Yeah. Right the on. operators on their walk around say generally yeah. they'll spot any leaks, any big leaks. Yeah. They'll report that. It's pretty sweet. A lot going on around here. Yeah. That's what the box of a 400 ton truck looks like. It's big. Yeah, it is pretty cool. You can see on the screens what's being done. Yeah. Whoa. Whoa. What do you think that's in reference to? No more yogurt. Yogurt is banned. We heard a story last night about there are these trucks, the autonomous trucks kept stopping and they couldn't figure out what the heck it was. They walk out onto the hall road and they find a little yogurt lid that was being picked up by the sensors. So the yogurt, the, the truck would see the yogurt lid and just stop and they wouldn't know what the heck was doing it. That's all it took. So no more yogurt, no more yogurt.
This is a, this was carrying pet coke. So where we were with Morgan, the last time we were here, with the petroleum coke, that's what this material is. That's what this, this thing hauls. And so you can see here as well, yeah. So since it, it carries pet coke, which is a much lighter material, it's very, very light. It's like pumice stone almost. Here is where the factory bed ends. So if you're hauling dirt or rock, the 100 ton truck, that's where it ends. But you can see all of this is built upon the top rail of the factory bed so that they can haul way more material because you can shove this thing as full as you want with that pet coke and you're still not gonna overload the truck. How does that guy have four arms? That's what happens when you uh, microwave your meals too many times over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's terrifying. Looks like <laughs> that's, so, that's so scary. <laughs> and with that, that's it for the shop. Chase, the tracks could belong to um, the Canadian toad. Do those look like Canadian toad tracks? No. No. Um, mule deer. Mule deer tracks? I don't know what that is. Uh, fox tracks. Big fox. Uh, timber wolves. That's scary. Timber wolves. That's scary. This is the Wapasu lookout at the Suncor base mine. You'll see in the footage, it is absolutely beautiful land. And what this was decades ago was actually the very first tailings pond at this mine. So what a tailings pond is, is the oil sand is mined, it's dropped into the crusher, it goes into processing, it's mixed with hot water, the hot water separates the oil from the sand, rock, clay, silt, whatever that is, uh, whatever waste material there is. Then that material, so the oil goes into processing, all of that is then pumped into this pond. So they build a dike around the pond and they pump the material out and it builds up over time, builds up, builds up, builds up. They can only build it to a certain elevation and then they must go elsewhere, this area, was mined out, they went across the river, now they're on the other side where we were yesterday. But once it's done, they let the water drain off, they cover the entire area with a huge amount of clay and then topsoil, and then they're able to plant all of the trees and the oats and all the different native grasses along here. This is the very first reclaimed oil sand mining pond in the entire area. So this is a really big deal. It's been here for a while, so you can see the trees are starting to grow up. But in another 10, 20 years, this will be absolutely beautiful. It'll be just like how it was when they found it. This goes to show, we've seen a lot of amazing things. We've seen the shovels, we've talked to the people, we've seen the robot trucks. But this goes to show that we can, humans, can extract the resources we need from the earth, the oil, whatever else it is that keeps everyday society moving, and then leave the environment the way we found it, if not better than we found it. This is amazing. This goes to show how much um, just effort and energy and thought miners in today's world, 2023, put in to making sure that they're doing it in the right way. I have heard about this Wapasu lookout from many people, not just the Suncor people. Someone texted me today, works out here. He said, you need to go to the Wapasu Lookout. People don't see this, but this is what we leave behind when we're done, and it's gorgeous. So the pride, the beauty, very cool.